Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin Smith. Tonight, South Africa is due to head up a peace mission of leaders from the continent set on mediating the war in Ukraine. President Cyril Ramaphosa says that Vladimir Putin and Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky have greenlit visits to Moscow and Kyiv for the initiative. Also, as innovators from across two continents meet in Marseille for the Europe Africa Forum, I talk to a top sustainability change maker about the importance of reimagining Africa's cities of the future. And we head to the Africa Pavilion at the Cannes Film Festival here in France, where offerings from the continent are more numerous than ever. Two African films, one from Senegal and another from Egypt, are in the running for the Palme d'Or. But first, South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa says that he'll be heading up a delegation of six African leaders who will meet Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky and, separately, Russian President Vladimir Putin on a peace mission for the war in Ukraine. Zambia, Senegal, Congo, Uganda and Egypt are reportedly part of the initiative, which will happen in Kyiv and Moscow. Nadine Tron tells us more. Cyril Ramaphosa has called both the presidents of Russia and Ukraine over the weekend to discuss an African peace mission to help resolve the conflict between the two countries. This follows allegations made by the United States ambassador to South Africa last week that South Africa is supplying arms to Russia and that this means the country is deviating from its neutral stance on the war. But Ruben Brigitte has in the meantime apologized for these claims and Ramaphosa has launched an independent inquiry into it. The Russian embassy also denied these claims. On Tuesday, Ramaphosa says he discussed efforts for peaceful resolution to the war with both with presidents Vladimir Putin and Volodymyr Zelensky. He also discussed the impact that the war has had on the African continent. Ramaphosa says both leaders agreed to receive an African peace mission led by heads of state from Zambia, Senegal, Congo, Uganda, Egypt and South Africa. Although no date has been set for the mission, Ramaphosa says its imminent preparations have already started and it will happen as soon as possible. On Monday, South Africa's head of the Defence Force visited Russia and the Kremlin said this was to discuss combat readiness. But on the same day, Ramaphosa said in his weekly newsletter that he's been under extreme pressure to pick a side in the war and that he won't, that South Africa remains impartial and hopes for peaceful resolution. Nadine Tron there for us. Now, there were more demonstrations in the Senegalese city of Zitrincho on Tuesday as supporters of the mayor and opposition leader, Usman Sonko, blocked off streets to stop him from being taken from his home. At least three people have died in Zitrincho and Dakar since Monday in unrest triggered by Sonko's scheduled appearance on Tuesday at his rape trial. Now, he didn't attend, has denied the allegations and says that they are just another political tactic to stop him running in 2024 elections. The trial has been adjourned until the 23rd. On Tuesday, changemakers from across two continents were in Marseille, the current European capital of innovation, for talks on how Europe and Africa can better work together in coming up with new ways of making a positive difference for as many people as possible, be that through tech, policy, cinema or the economy. Now, one of the voices at the Europe Africa Forum was that of Andrea Jeremica, who heads up the European Institute of Innovation for Sustainability. He joins us now. And Dania, thanks very much for making time to speak to Ion Africa. Now, what's your take on, on how, when it comes to innovate, innovative urban future proofing, what do the priorities of Africa and Europe have in common? Good evening, and thank you for having me. So when uh, we are talking about sustainability, it's obvious that uh, we don't have winners or losers, or we all win or we all lose. So we have a, a lot in common. <laughs> so uh, in our institute, we always say that the most important tool that we have to face a climate crisis is education. Because uh, with education, we have to, you know, uh, understand that we are fighting uh, like carbon dioxide. That is uh, a gas that is transparent, so colorless, odorless, untouchable. So we have really to understand uh, what's going on and how to fight. I'm always saying that uh, we are living in an emergency. So it's like we are in a boat in the middle of the sea and we are sinking. 
a lot of water. What we have to do, the first reaction we have is, of course, to get off the water from the boat. But at some point, we have to repair that all if we don't want to leave an emergency for the rest of our life. That's repairing the all, in my opinion, is education and is what we have to do and what we have to do in uh, Africa and in Europe. And when it comes to education, is there any kind of specific issues that you would be focusing on when it comes to the continent? Well, one topic that, in my opinion, is always underestimated is the importance of biodiversity. Because uh, biodiversity is the topic just right now, even because it's the problem and it's a solution. So, yes, definitely biodiversity. Now, sustainability, you know, coming off the back of what you just highlighted about the importance being of uh, biodiversity, sustainability has to ideally be integrated into every aspect of African development. Does that in any way get in the way of innovation? Yes. Well, sustainability means last over time. So if we want to last over time, it's obvious that we have to innovate what we are doing and how we are doing things. So innovation on the other side is really expensive and is really, really hard. So there's no point to innovate if we don't have to reach sustainability. But the problem is that, you know, even if we say something different, we don't like innovation because innovation is changing our habits. Just to give you a, a quick example, we all use the same keyboard, the QWERTY keyboard, with few uh, differences, but it's the same keyboard. And the IP of this keyboard was invented last century. And it was not for computers, of course. It was not for a smartphone. It was for typewriter. And the goal of that IP, of that patent, was to reduce the speed about how we are writing, how we are typing. And even if a lot of time passed, we didn't change that way because we got used to it. So this is how hard it is to innovate and change our habits. And what's your take on how the innovative strategies needed in Africa specifically can practically sync with those applied in Europe? The two regions have such hugely different economic profiles. Well, of course, they have a huge opportunity in Africa because uh, what they need is partnership. Like in Europe, to be honest, if we want to be sustainable, we have to partner at all level. But they have a huge opportunity because now they can really imagine the future of their cities. Uh, we are not good as human beings in thinking about the future because think that the same area of the brain that we are using when we are thinking about the future is the same area we are using when we are recalled memory. So every time we're trying to push ourselves into the future, we are always obtaining just a present 2.0. And we have a lot of boundaries. In Africa, we can start from scratch, we can start from zero, and we can ask ourselves how we want to make people live there. It's not about hospitals, it's not about infrastructure, it's about people, how we want them to live there. Thanks very much, Andrea Jeremika there from the, the Director General of the European Institute of Innovation for Sustainability. Now, staying with the idea of bridging between continents, Africa has put on a particularly strong showing at this year's 76th Cannes Film Festival being held here in France. South African film The Voice Behind the Wall has already won the prize for Best African Film, but two films from the continent are also vying for the absolute top prize of the coveted Palm d'Or. Emma Jones tells us more from the cinematic sands of Cannes. It feels like this is really the year when African filmmaking is finally coming into prominence at the Cannes Film Festival. There's a first-time feature film in competition here in Cannes by French Senegalese director Ramata Toulier-Si. The film is called Banel et Adama, and it's the story of two lovers living in a remote Senegalese village who just want to be together, but it's going against the traditions of their village by doing so 
also in competition, another filmmaker, uh, Kauta Ben Hania, who hails from Tunisia. Now, she's already been Oscar nominated for her last film, The Man Who Sold His Skin. And she's here this year with a film called Four Daughters, which sounds quite provocative. It's about a Tunisian mother with four daughters. One day, two of them mysteriously disappear, and Kauta brings professional actresses to replace them. So everybody's really looking forward to seeing what those two movies bring. Also in the uncertain regard section, which is the sidebar of the official selection at Cannes, there are two more African films. One is a film from the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's called Omen by Boloji, and it's the story of a man who's been in Europe for 15 years. He comes back uh, home and he brings with him his white fiancée. And then there's a debut feature film from Sudan as well, which is a country tragically in the news uh, right now. But this this film is called uh, Goodbye Julia by Mohamed Kordofani and it's the story of a meeting between two women, one from North and one from South Sudan and the complexities of their relationships, he says, attempts to address some of the differences between these two parts of the world. So really, for the first time, African filmmaking is really getting a major world platform here at the world's biggest film festival. And finally, Nigerians have gone wild for the taste of success after one of their own cooked up a storm. Record-breaking chef Hilda Bassi spent 100 hours preparing meals non-stop, aiming to set a Guinness World Record for the longest ever cooking session by one person. Olivia Bizot with more. Egged on by thousands of supporters, Nigerian chef Hilda Bassi has broken a world record after cooking non-stop for a hundred hours. I generally just feel a lot of relief and I'm very happy and I'm very proud. I, the turnout was very unexpected, so that definitely surprised me. Over four days, the 27-year-old dished up more than 55 recipes and over a hundred meals, which were all shared with the crowds who came to watch history being made. Everyone will be talking about being Nigerian for a very, very long time. I feel very proud and honoured. Hilda Bassi's feat has captivated the country, with politicians and local celebrities stopping by to cheer her on and hundreds of people camping outside the venue. I feel so good. I feel so excited witnessing Hilda break the world Guinness record and creating another record. Oh, my God, I'm really so happy. And it's coming from a Nigerian. Chef Bassi wasn't allowed to sleep or even sit down, except during short five-minute breaks every hour. Guinness has said it's reviewing the evidence before certifying the world record. I wish my family was that excited when I cooked. Well, well done, Hilda. Uh, that is, though, all we have time for for Eye on Africa. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Till then, take care. France 24, every art form. Liberté, égalité, actualité. The world is ever changing. The news doesn't wait. France 24 gives a global perspective that an educated, intelligent, and active viewer is going to want to have to be able to fully understand the issues of the day. That's why it will always be there to help make sense of world events. J'ai l'habitude de suivre France 24. Partout où je me trouve, et ce grâce à mon smartphone, parce que je ne reste pas souvent devant la télé. Quand une information survient sur la toile, j'utilise l'application de France 24 pour vérifier l'authenticité. For the best international coverage, 24 hours a day, no matter what, France 24 is with you everywhere, all the time. Liberté, égalité, actualité. actualité.